Shalom, shalom. Today, I have a message that is really very, very important for everyone that is listening because it determines how your life will develop. <clears throat> All of us have like glasses on our heart, on our soul. And one lens determines how you see God and the other lens determines how you see yourself. There I want to talk that the, the message today is the God who gives me a new identity. And there we want to look at Moses. Yeah, I love Moses. He went to all the heights and depths, also like David. And we have to learn from our relatives. So this is now in uh, Exodus 2, 11 to 19. Many years later, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews. He saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. The next day, when Moses went out to visit his people, he saw two Hebrews, two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating up your friend, Moses said to the one who started the fight. The man replied, who appointed you to be our prince and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses was afraid, thinking, everyone knows now what I did. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened and he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. When Moses arrived in Midian, he sat down, excuse me, <coughs> he sat down beside a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters who came as usual to draw water and fill the water troughs for their father's flocks. But some other shepherds came and chased them away. So Moses jumped up and rescued the girls from the shepherds. Then he drew water for their flocks. When the girls returned to Royal, their father, he asked, why are you back so soon today? An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds, they answered. And then he drew water for us and watered our flocks. Now, Moses was sitting by the well, dressed like an Egyptian. Did this make him an Egyptian? No, he was wearing the wrong clothes. He was dressed like a son of the world, but he was really a son of a Levite. And while he was still in his mother's womb, he had been chosen to be the leader of a nation. Through the guidance of God, he was brought up in the Egyptian royal courts and, humanly speaking, received the best education that was possible in those days, learning to become a ruler. He was raised as an Egyptian and dressed like an Egyptian. When Moses was given the first opportunity of acting like a ruler, he reacted very impulsively. He saw an Egyptian tormenting one of his fellow or countrymen and immediately set himself up as a judge and killed the Egyptian. His calling, however, was not taken away from him, and God, but God led him into the desert. I think God said, my boy, I've called you to be the leader of a nation, but there's still some work to do on your character. And at that time, he was still wearing clothes that did not correspond to his true identity. He was never an Egyptian. He was a Hebrew. The question that is raised for us here is, where do we look for our identity? Now, in our Western world, many people try to gain their identity through performance, good deeds, ambition, sport, sport achievements, hobbies, or hard work. We often seek identity in our gifts. I remember when I was still living in America, a lady came to me and she was a well-known gospel singer and she, she had ihre Stimme verloren. 
Und sie war so entsetzt, sie war fertig. Sie hat gesagt, Gott hat mir die Stimme weg. Oh, I'm speaking German now. I need to repeat that. Can you cut that out? No, no, cut it out. Yeah. yeah. So I remember one situation in America. One lady came one day. She was a well-known gospel singer. And, and she had no voice anymore. She had, she had no voice anymore. She couldn't talk anymore. And she was totally devastated. The singing was her identity. I mean, she did a good job. She was a gospel singer. And yet, this gift stood between her and God. She identified herself with this, in this gift and not in her identity in Jesus Christ. So she, she repented then. She, I told her, I said, was this, was this identity of yours to be a good gospel singer? She said, yes. I said, you will be a better gospel singer after God gives back the anointing because it's the anointing that you need. And she became a much better gospel singer after she repented of having an idol in her life. So, <clears throat> now for years I found my identity in my humanitarian activities. But it was only a robe of self-righteousness. If there was a, a need anywhere, it was my command to act. <clears throat> I, was, I saw myself as a helpful person, someone who did social work, until the Lord said one day to me, I don't want your good works, I want you. That was very shocking, because I didn't have an identity without good works. But now I do, do have it. The Lord even asked me several years ago, Maria, if I never used you in any life, would you still love me? I said, Lord, then you can take me home. Then I, I'm, I'm no, I have no use anymore in this world. He said, uh-huh. Your service has become more important to you than your relationship to me. Dear ones, the flesh gets very religious before it dies. Yep. Also, Moses' identity came from his upbringing as the son of the Egyptian king. But God was unable to work with him in this identity. He could not use him like this for his calling. For this reason, God led Moses into the desert. And sometimes, dear ones, God has to lead us into the desert. There we have private audience with God, and God can fully have our attention. I, I remember two, three times I said, Lord, where did I see any, overlook any warning? How did I end up in this desert? He said, you didn't overlook any warning. I led you here, I led you here. So Moses was in that desert for 40 years, and during this period, he had taken on the identity of a shepherd and no longer possessed the identity of a king's son. He now looked like a shepherd, he spoke like a shepherd, he thought like a shepherd, he felt like a shepherd, and acted like a shepherd. Now in Exodus 3, we, we read, <clears throat> One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Hethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it did not burn. Now, we hear for the first time in this, situ in this situation that Moses came in direct relationship with God. He begins to speak with God, and God reveals his heart to him. God said to Moses, I am who I am, the eternally present one. And dear ones, I, I advise you, live in the present. The past is gone. The future is not yet here. God is the God of the now, now, now. And you will see, when you start living in the present, there is a change in your life. So, uh, we see the living God beginning to speak to Moses 
This burning bush experience was very important for Moses. He sees a burning bush that's on fire, but not being burned. Not being consumed by fire. The whole matter becomes even more incredible for Moses, for God gives him the commission to go back to Egypt. But Moses, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, he protested. Again he protested. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff. Moses replied, throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. This we read in Exodus 4, 1 to 3a. Now Moses had given up everything. He, has, he had nothing left from his Egyptian lifestyle. But now God is touching his new lifestyle of a shepherd. He was living 40 years in a shepherd, as a shepherd. He thought of a shepherd, he looked like a shepherd, he acted like a shepherd. Now he was a shepherd through and through and had let go of everything, almost everything. He was still holding on to this shepherd's rod that confirmed his identity as a shepherd. I can imagine that God said, uh, that, uh, that he said to him, now God, I've let go of everything. Now that stupid rod can cannot mean anything to you. I said, really, meaningless thing. But although Moses perhaps didn't understand why he should let go of the rod and throw it to the ground, he still obeyed. He threw it down and became a snake. Moses jumped back and was horrified. Listen, everything we find our identity in outside Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross is a snake. And then Moses jumped back, he was, he was horrified. Then God said, reach out and grab it at its tail. Now, for someone that has been a shepherd for 40 years in the desert, Moses knew he must never grab a, a snake at the tail or she will bite him. Now it was the last test that men have to go through. It's to give up their logic. Because the logic is the strongest identity in a man's life. For women, it's the heart. But for, for men, it's the logic. And Moses had, but he had already learned that anything God asks, he can do. So he had learned to obey God more than his own logic. He took the snake at its tail and it became a stick. God wants us to discover him and ourselves in the desert. So you know, when Moses threw that stick down and it turned into a big snake, he made a big jump. He was very happy to be rid of that thing. And he had no idea how dangerous that thing was in his hands. But then God, then the test came. Grab it at the tail, God said to him. And you know, a shepherd that has left, lived 40 years in the desert knows snake, tail, bite. So that was the logic reasoning of Moses. But Moses was already at that point, and I think it was after he had this experience of the burning bush, that a bush can burn and thus not, is not getting consumed by it that he realized that God has other dimensions and that he can trust and obey him. He took the snake at the tail and immediately it became the same stick that was there before. So uh, now he had learned to obey God more than his own logic. Now God wants us to discover him and ourselves in the desert. Several times God led me in the desert and I complained. I said, what did I overlook? He said, nothing. I brought you here. So now Moses gave up both identities in the desert, the identity of a king's son and also the desert of a shepherd. And by doing so, he made himself completely dependent on God. And I promise you, when you come to the point 
where your only source in life is God himself, you have reached the greatest maturity and all sufficiency. So now let's take a look at Jesus. How, where did he find his identity? Jesus was a carpenter from Nazareth. And people said to him, of him, how oh, can anything good come out from Nazareth? Traveling through the country with his disciples, he had no permanent home apart from a short time in Capernaum. He came into the world in a borrowed stable, lived in the houses of strangers, was supported by rich women, rode on a borrowed donkey and was buried in a borrowed tomb. Jesus traveled from place to place and preached on the streets, and his co-workers were anything but perfect. They were constantly involved in petty jealousy. Who would sit at the right and on the left side? When he needed them most, they were asleep. One of them betrayed him, and one of them denied him, and one of them committed suicide. I remember quite a few years back, I complained to God about my, my, my co-workers, and he gave me, he said, look at mine. And he told me this, and he opened my eyes, that they were everything but perfect. And he even said, how much longer do I have to put up with you? I can understand the Lord. But this... Did this really affect Jesus? Did it influence his identity? Definitely not. For Jesus knew that his identity was completely dependent on his relationship with the Father. He knew that his Father loved him and was there for him. Even if the whole world should reject him, he was certain that the Father would be very pleased with him what about your identity? We often try to find our identity in someone we think uh, that can put our world right. Uh, dear ones, we look for strong people, for, for people, uh, well, we, we just look for someone that would make up for our shortcomings. And you know, a lot of times people even flee into illnesses, sicknesses, in order to give them an identity. Sometimes we try to obtain love through suffering, uh, especially children that have never had the attention of parents because they were so busy in their business. But when they were sick, the parents took care of them. So later in life, they develop, this is subconsciously, a pattern of sickness. And there, one time a lady, I told a lady that had this problem, I said, are you willing to give up the love you get when you're sick? She said, well, Maria, you don't know what you're asking. This is my only source of, of love. Dear ones, it is manipulation of the flesh. Sometimes we try to obtain love through suffering, and on one hand it does it does us good. On the other hand, we can become addicted. It is obsessive behavior. We make people dependent on us. Sometimes we even subconsciously use depression or self-pity for this. Where do you find your identity? Dr. Neil T. Anderson once said, the understanding of your identity in Christ is absolutely fundamental to living a victorious and balanced life in Christ. And how many times we have spent years with studies, with hard work, with accumulating riches, with being the best sportsman, the best singer, to make ourselves an identity. But only when we find it totally in Christ will everything else be a blessing, but the identity will not be shaken when any of these other issues are taken away from us. Dr. Timothy Warner explains the lies that Satan frequently uses to rob us of the true identity that God wants to give us. And next time, in the next YouTube, I want to talk about those lies that we have believed, that have stolen us the, true, the truth that sets us free. 
And I think every one of us, because the Lord says that we are to renew our thinking daily by reading the Word of God, not the newspapers, not the television, not radio, by reading the Word of God. We are to renew our spirit, to renew our thinking, to renew who we are in Christ. And dear ones, only once you know who you are in Christ and who God is, will you have a clear, straight way to become the dream of God. Shalom, shalom. <laughs>